Spangleburger in the Carson video, I'm standing uh, next to the robot inside of its workspace and I'm not too scared. Um, the robot, even if it was trying to hold position as tight as it could, I could just grab it and move it, right? And that's again by design. We've put the motors, even though it's got these massive biceps, um, they're not actually biceps. Um, they're just a place where there's a fan, I think. Um, but it's got a relatively small motor up here because it doesn't have to hold, that motor doesn't have to hold the whole arm up. That motor can just hold the payload, which is designed to be about five pounds, right? So it's, you're pretty much stronger than it. You can open its grippers. And in this particular mode, what it's doing is whenever I move it to a position, it just holds that position from then on. We call this mannequin mode. Um, and it turns out to be nice to kind of show it off. Um, and it's great for taking pictures. Um, not much else. Um, so here's a, so I'll just go top down. This is not standard equipment, although we're starting to put them on. This is an Xbox uh, uh, Connect, Microsoft Connect for the Xbox 360. <laughs> Turns out, so this is, this is a message for this audience. This is awesome. This comes out of the consumer electronics industry. It's 150 bucks, and it gives us 3D point clouds in real time, right? Before that came out, we built this robot. This has two sets of stereo cameras, one wide angle, one narrow angle. This is actually a texture projector that puts out a bright red light um, with a pattern so that when you aim it at like a tabletop, you can get really good stereo data. Turns out stereo doesn't work real well on objects without texture, right? Stereo is about looking at the same piece of texture from your two eyes. Your eyes are really good at it, right? Again, the sensors that we have aren't that great. Um, and so when you have a sensor that's, you know, a little bit not perfect and you can't see all of the, the texture in an object, if you don't have texture, you can't do much. Um, and then this is a high resolution video camera. There's also two uh, cameras in the forearms which are intended to give you a close up view of whatever the robot's grabbing right now. Um, turns out, in hindsight, we should have made those stereo cameras because, and we should have put them here. Because what you really want when you're kind of trying to grab something is to know exactly where it is in space precisely. And you can't quite get that with this. You can kind of get it with this, but you're now at a meter away and so you have error. Um, this is a tilt laser, which is not tilting right now, but it goes up and down. Um, and down here is a, another laser. These are the laser scanners that come out of the garage door industry or the industrial automation industry, where you basically want to create a light curtain and keep people out. It turns out the way that they work, they send the laser back and forth at 40 hertz, giving you distance information. And so they've also been adopted widely in the robotics industry to help you do um, navigation. So most common sort of inexpensive robot and probably the best results over the last, um, maybe the, from, from 15 years ago till the last, till five years ago, was to solve the navigation problem, which means you put down a robot and you want it to drive around without getting lost, and the way they do that is they put a laser scanner, they see the walls, they get a 2D map of the walls, like what you were seeing on the screen there, um, and in this case there's no walls, but it was actually making a map of this and the monitors and other things, enough that we figured it could localize. That was odd. Was oh, that you? Oh, there's. I was like, wait a minute, it's doing something else. Tony's telling it to do something, so you can actually see my. Oh, switching back and forth. Um, he's actually showing you the video live from this camera on the tablet up through there. It's it's amazing. Um, so the, the laser scanners are cool. This one's what's traditionally done in robotics. This one, when you start tilting, it all of a sudden gives you a 3D point cloud. Right? Now, the Kinect gives you a 3D point cloud, but not until a year ago. Um, and it only gives you a, a 3D point cloud in your living room, meaning it's really, really good at couch distance right, from the robot, because that's what it's designed for. If you go uh, couch distance times two, it just says you're far away. Right? And all those distances beyond the couch are just far. Um, and if you're half a meter within it, it's totally blind, right? So the Kinect is, has its limitations. Again, it's designed for what it's, it's good at. These lasers are really good out, probably not as big as this auditorium, but easily as big as the stage, right? They can see all the walls um, in a fairly large room, and they'll give you distances very accurately all the way around. Um, okay, so that's, that's the sensor suite. I talked to you about the arms. Um, the head's just on a simple pan tilt, um, and you'll notice this industrial design um, if you look at it closely, there's basically this bolt hole pattern all over the top where the connect is attached. And the intent is to make it so it's easy to attach other sensors. This robot is not designed, as I said, to go in your home, per se. It's designed to uh, go into a research lab and help people develop the next generation algorithms. And the state of the art of robotics right now is, how can I come over to this table, identify what's sitting on it, and pick it up successfully 
and then manipulate it in some way, put it somewhere else. That's pretty much where we are. We're putting together basic object recognition primitives with basic grasping. And you think grasping is, oh, you just put the gripper there and, and grab, right? But it's a lot of um, subtlety about how you actually grab an object. If you think of an object like, like this one, I can't just grab it here, or I don't usually just grab it here, right? I want to grab, you, you know as a human, I'll grab it here, and, and you can actually do a lot with your hand. You can, you know, with one hand, you know, take it off, right? But um, that would be actually quite a challenge for a robot to do at this point in time, at least autonomously. Um, and even under remote operation, it would be challenging because how do you tell it to do that? And I was using the fact that I have, you know, lots of, of fingers here. Um, hands with, with uh, five fingers and humanoid, there's a lot of people who are making them in robotics, um, and they almost always break, right? <laughs> if you want to actually use it for a task, it's going to work for 20 minutes, and then you'll re-cable re it or whatever you're doing. Um, Again, just to state of the art today. The, um, in the base of this robot, there are two computers. Um, we put uh, eight cores in each one, so eight i7 uh, Nehalon chips. Um, there's 24 gigs of RAM in each computer and one and a half terabytes of disk in each computer. In other words, pretty beefy, uh, at least for us uh, computers. And when you figure that's two, that's 16 cores. It's, it's pretty decent. Um, it runs hot, right? So this is my second call for cool chips, right? This, one of the things that we need in robots is, is to figure out how to not have 60% of the battery going into the computers and not the motors, 